Okay, so <clears throat> continuing our discussion of uh, eschatology for uh, those of you that are enrolled in this course, um, this is an extra lecture, um, not on the syllabus, um, but one I wanted to, to share, information I wanted to share. So <clears throat> give a little background of what we're doing here uh, in this lecture, give you sort of a, a personal um, anecdotal information that that drove me to, to research this issue of the rapture. So I grew up in a denomination, <clears throat> I grew up in the Church of God, which is a, a Pentecostal denomination, um, the oldest actually Pentecostal denomination. And in the statement of faith, in the belief statement <clears throat> on the church's website, on the denomination's website, it says we believe in the um, I don't remember how it's worded, but we believe in the premillennial, pre-tribulational rapture of the church. And so growing up, I really never doubted that. And it's interesting <clears throat> thinking back on the number of sermons that I've sat through. And, and quite honestly, the number of sermons that I probably preached where I alluded to this idea of the rapture, which we're going to define that if you're new to this theology and you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, I'll, I'll define it. But it's a major theme in the preaching and teaching because it's this, it's this high expectation that something's going to happen. <clears throat> and we call that something the, the rapture. And so when I was in college in, in the 90s, one of my professors, um, actually, she became, when I went to graduate school later in life, uh, she became my graduate thesis supervisor, and, uh, one of my mentors, really, Dr. Kimberly Alexander. She just mentioned as anecdotally, just an aside in one of the courses that I had with her that um, rapture theology wasn't either historically or biblically a, a good doctrine. And I don't remember the context or anything. I just remember that that's the first time I'd ever heard anyone <clears throat> say anything you know, that, that even alluded to the reality that maybe the rapture wasn't real. And it's important to note that I was at Lee University, which is the, uh, the denomination, the Church of God, their flagship college. And so this was, you know, this would her, this was her making a statement in, um, in class that, that really sort of pushed back against the official teachings of the denomination. But of course, Lee is a very good school. They, they allowed that, you know, professors had freedom to do things like that, at least as far as I knew. So it's taken me a few decades uh, to sort of come full circle, but <clears throat> I was allowed the opportunity to pursue an independent research project, uh, a 15, 16 week independent research project. And you could pick anything you wanted to pick. You just research it, come up with a really good thesis, have to have your thesis approved, and then uh, you start writing. And that's what I did. And, and I did it on the theme of the rapture. <clears throat> and so the, the, the thesis that I pursued was, is rapture theology compatible with anti-Nicene, that's A-N-T-E dash Nicene theology. And I'll tell you why I chose anti-Nicene, what that means. <clears throat> as we go. And I apologize for my voice. I've had a cold. So let's talk about what the rapture is. So it's a Christian doctrine. It's an eschatological Christian doctrine, doctrine of the last things um, that is concerned with the, the final days of human history. So historically, Christians have believed that Jesus, you know, Jesus uh, was crucified, dead, buried, and then he ascended according to the Gospels, ascended into heaven and said that in the same way you've seen me come, I'll come back. And so <clears throat> traditionally, Christians believe that Jesus would return at the end of time. After the Antichrist reign, after the Great Tribulation and before the world's judged. But the rapture is a doctrine that says that Jesus will secretly return. Now, the word secretly is not used anymore because it um, probably because of the way it sounds, but the, but the actual doctrine is that Jesus will secretly return prior to the great tribulation and will take Christians 
both living and dead, up to heaven so that they escape the Antichrist reign and they escape the Great Tribulation. Now, this was made popular in the 1800s by a man, by um, um, and he was English, but he was in the Irish Protestant Church, uh, John Nelson Darby in the 1800s, and it was popularized. So he taught it. He was really the first one to teach it. And it was popularized by one of his associates named Cyrus Schofield. Cyrus Schofield um, created a study Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. And th that was the reference Bible that if, if you were a Pentecostal in the part of the world where I grew up in the southeastern United States, and you had a reference Bible, there was a really good chance that you had the Schofield reference Bible in the King James Version. So, <clears throat> so Darby taught this doctrine of the rapture. And here's what he said about his entire approach to es eschatology, not just the rapture. The rapture certainly falls in this. But he said, quote, that, that what he was teaching, his eschatology, quote, ruled the intelligence, sustained the hope, and inspired the conduct of the apostles. So I'm asking in my research project, did it? Did it rule the intelligence, sustain the hope, and inspire the conduct, conduct of the apostles? And the time period that I chose is what we refer to in history, um, history of Christianity as the anti-Nicene period. So if you think antebellum, think about the southern United States antebellum. That was before the Civil War. So anti, A-N-T-E, means before. Antipasta, right? It's the, the meal before the meal. So, so, so I chose the anti-Nicene period because Darby insisted that his eschatological system was evident in the teaching of the apostle, in the apostles. So the teaching of the apostles is reflected in the text of the New Testament. And since the text, the biblical text, that Darby uses to prove his doctrine of the rapture, since that text is debated, right? It's not like it's an open and shut case. The next place to look would be the generation of Christians that immediately lived after the apostles. And this was from the death of of uh, John the disciple after he wrote Revelation until the year 325, which is when the, the Nicene, the, the Council of Nicaea met. So we're looking at the first couple of generations of Christians that would have lived immediately after the apostles. And so part of my thesis was that if, <clears throat> if Darby's correct, if his eschatology, quote, ruled the intelligence, sustained the hope, and inspired the conduct of the apostles, then, then this is definitely a doctrine that would have been passed down to that first generation of Christians. If anyone was going to express hope in a rapture based on the text that this first generation of Christians had just received, anyone was going to express that hope and it was going to be these these first christians so i went looking there but before i talk about the the text the resources that i reviewed i want to talk about john darby just a little bit very interesting person very dynamic charismatic character um, he was a prolific writer he just wrote everything it's hard to even imagine all the things he wrote he wrote um, commentaries on almost every book in the Bible, uh, stacks of letters, and through all that teaching and all those letters, he very seldom said anything about himself personally. Um, in fact, um, some of his followers, and I use that term loosely because he didn't really have followers like a cult. It wasn't a cult. Um, he was just a very popular teacher. But Darby um, was was so guarded personally that there were people that knew him and and knew his teachings and interacted with him that thought his mother was dead. I mean, his mother was alive. Like, he never talked about his family. He never talked about himself. Um, from every 
everything I can get. I was a very pious person, um, very serious about wanting to under, understand <clears throat> the meaning of the biblical text. Um, and so I, I don't think he was a charlatan by any means or, or a false teacher in that regard. Um, I, I think he was doing the best with, with what he had. But he was originally an attorney, went and studied law, decided to abandon law and pursue ordination. When he did that, his dad said, well, if you're going to do that, I wanted you to be a lawyer. If you're going to pursue the ministry, then you're cut out of the will. No inheritance for you. So it's it cost him a lot uh, to go into the ministry, but he was really interested in prophecy, really interested in, uh, in eschatology, those sort of things. And so, <clears throat> and so his theology of the rapture is the, the linchpin, if you will, in his theology is Revelation 12, 1 through 5. And I, from the NIV, reads, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with, the seven, head, with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. So it's that last, that last line of that text that he interpreted to be the rapture. So he interpreted in this text, the dragon would be Satan. The woman, the pregnant woman who gives birth, the woman is the Jewish nation or the Jewish people. This was Darby's interpretation. And the male child, he interpreted to be the church, which would be snatched up. Now, what's interesting is most people assume that Darby predicated his rapture theology on 1 Thessalonians 4. And if you're familiar with that text, it's the, the quintessential text used to talk about the rapture. So Revelation 12, 5, not really talked about as much. But when people who believe the rapture want to talk about the rapture, they will quote from Paul, 1 Thessalonians. I'll tell you what, I'm going to read it. i got my Bible over here. Um, try to find it really quickly. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verses 13 through 18. And this is what Paul says to the Thessalonians. He says, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or die or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. And here it is. Here's the, the quintessential rapture text for people that believe the rapture today. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord Forever, therefore, encourage each other with these words. So based on uh, Darby's interpretation of Revelation 12, 5, he interpreted that text to mean that that was when the child would be snatched up, which I think is really interesting. But it's important to note that the, the linchpin, the, the text, based on Darby's own words in his commentary on Revelation and other things he wrote, was Revelation 12, 5 is the linchpin to his theology. So going back to how I did my research. So <clears throat> I wanted to find out what did the early church believe about the last days? So I wanted to really get a picture of early church eschatology, anti-Nicene eschatology. So what that required me to do 
is read dozens of documents from the Antonicene period, really more than dozens, it, um, 50, maybe 60 documents that I could get my hands on that covered a, a period even extending beyond 325, that maybe it was, maybe these documents were, were um, the dating of them, maybe extended beyond 325, but could have been before. So I'm like, well, I'll just see what it says. So all these documents, well, then I had to set aside those documents that had eschatological statements or teachings in them that, that came anywhere near sort of what's going to happen at the end, right? So I surveyed all the writings that I could, and, and here are the ones that I found that had the most substantial eschatology, if you will. And look, if, if you're a Christian history buff, all of these are available. Uh, the translations of all of these are available. Um, but the, the, the documents that I found that had significant, significant enough eschatology for me to really uh, dive into were the first letter of Clement, the epistle of Barnabas, the Didache, and we'll talk about the Didache in just a minute, um, the writings of Ignatius of Antioch, the writings of Polycarp, the second letter of Clement, the shepherd of Hermas, great book, uh, great letter. Um, if you ever get a chance to read the shepherd of Hermas, it's, it's awesome. Um, Papias, the, uh, the writings of Papias, um, Irenaeus wrote um, several letters against heresies. Uh, we, that's, the, that's what we call that collection of writings against Gnosticism, against heresies. Uh, the writings of Tertullian, the writings of Hippolytus, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen. So it was these writings and these people really that that I was able to, to really pull eschatology from. But even among that group, there were really there were really four different documents from really before John died, all the way until 325, really only four documents that had enough eschatology in it that I could get a glimpse, a real solid glimpse of what the early church believed about the last days. And that was the first letter of Clement, uh, chose it because of its early dating, the epistle of, the epistle of Barnabas, um, because it has an eschatological timeline. Uh, he actually gives a timeline. Uh, the Didache, probably the most significant document that I reviewed, and we'll talk about it in a minute. And then um, Irenaeus's letters against heresies, because he believed that the resurrection of believers was essential to this moral argument that he, he was making. So here's what we're going to do. i um, going to try to be brief without sacrificing content um, and kind of go through those four documents and what I found regarding eschatology. So the first letter of Clement written sometime between 80 and 100, uh, possibly even written before John wrote Revelation, and it was written by a man named Clement. Clement was associated with the church at Rome. Some people say he was a bishop. Some people say he was really just a secretary of the church. I don't know for sure, and historians like to argue about things like that. So we're just going to say he was associated definitively uh, with the church at Rome. So Clement wrote this letter. Because the Corinthians, if you're familiar with the New Testament, uh, the Corinthians like to stir the pot. And so at the time of Clement's writings, uh, the Corinthians had deposed the church leaders, uh, kicked them out and said, you're, you're not our leaders anymore. And so Clement is really dealing with this, um, this uprising, if you will, in the Corinthian church and trying to trying to use every sort of means he could to to bring the church back together and, and bring them back to unity. And using eschatology was a part, you know, looking forward in the future to the hope that we have is, is one of the tools that Clement used to try to spur the Corinthians on to unity. So he's not primarily concerned with eschatology in this letter, but in sections 23 through 38, he appeals to the eminence of Jesus's return as a reason for them to correct their behavior. 
Um, he points to the hope of the resurrection of believers as a motivation to, to do right and live a holy life. And he encourages the Corinthians to be mindful of coming judgment, to encourage them to change their sinful behavior. So although his eschatological statements are brief, it, written, very likely written, at the same time that John was alive, certainly written during the same time John was alive, because John was 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 martyred in 98 or 99, depending on how you date it, it could be 97, but right at the end of the first century. So First Clement was written while one of the chief apostles was alive. And um, we have this really early church, not apostolic, but we have this really apostolic era eschatology coming out of First Clement. So what I ran into through all the sources, and I'll just kind of give the the, the store away here is I don't find any hint of any, any rapture theology at all, any, none. And so what I'm dealing with in all these documents is I'm dealing with an absence. There's so first Clement, there's, there's, there is an, there's an appeal to the imminent return of Jesus, but not a rapture. Um, you have to remember that during this period in time, Christianity was considered an illegal religion. It was considered atheism. And so um, it was against the law to be a Christian. As soon as Rome figured out that Christianity wasn't Judaism, it became against the law. And there was some persecution that went along with that. And there was this real belief that the Roman emperor was the Antichrist. And so for a lot of these early Christians, they kind of felt like, man, it can't get any worse than this. You've got Nero over here burning Christians um, to light a party. I mean, you've got all these different um, emperors that come along and, and you know, have all these. Um, that wasn't like some widespread persecution, if that's your idea of early church persecution, but it was sort of localized and it was real. Um, and so there was this idea that, well, look, this is about as bad as it gets. And so we're living in the tribulation. And so they considered the imminent return of Jesus to be something that, that could happen at any moment without really, without sacrificing their eschatology. So, so he actually aligns the resurrection of the church with coming judgment, not escape from tribulation. Remember, the rapture is all about escaping tribulation, being snatched up so that the dragon can't get it, right? So, so instead of Clement appealing to, hey, Jesus is coming soon to rescue us from this tribulation. Um, Clement appealed to the resurrection at Jesus's return and judgment. So Jesus is coming soon. Judgment follows. So get your act together, Corinthians, because you don't want to be on the wrong side of judgment. And so if, according to Darby, the notion of the rapture was a dominant part of apostolic eschatology, then I think it's reasonable to expect that we would have at least some mention of it. But again, the, the doctrine is absent from First Clement. The second letter I looked at was the Epistle of Barnabas. Um, in this letter, we attribute it to someone named Barnabas, but really the author is unknown. But it's associated with an Alexandrian Jew who lived during the reigns of the emperors, uh, Roman emperors, uh, Trajan and Hadrian. So that is between 98 and 138. So this would have been sometime at the end of John's life uh, up to 138. It was written to address how Christians should interpret Jewish scriptures and what the relationship should be between Christianity and Judaism. So Barnabas contains more eschatological content than First Clement, but it's still very limited in scope. So in the Epistle of Barnabas, in chapter 15, um, he makes the following definitive statement about the last days and offers kind of a timeline. He says, now this is Barnabas, when his son comes, he will destroy the time of the lawless one and will judge the ungodly and will change the sun and the moon and the stars. 
So when his son comes, when Jesus returns, at the time he returns, he will destroy the time of the lawless one and will judge the ungodly and will change the sun and the moon and the stars. So what we have in Barnabas is we have a little more organized eschatology than we had in First Clement. And what Barnabas is arguing explicitly for is one return of Jesus and judgment at the return. So there's there's the return and the judgment. So we saw that in Clement, right? Clement says to the Corinthians, hey, judgment's coming. Get your act together. Barnabas comes along and he talks about the second coming of Jesus and judgment that follows. So he doesn't allude to or reference to any doctrine similar to Darby's. Um, in fact, his eschatological timeline has Jesus coming after the Antichrist. He actually says that. He, in his timeline, he lists the, the lawless one. That's the Antichrist. He has Jesus coming after the Antichrist reign and immediately prior to the judgment of the nations. So that's the, the epistle of Barnabas. Now, the Didache. If you're interested in history of Christianity at all, you need to get a copy of the Didache. It has a really long, the, the, the official title of the document is the teaching of the Lord to the Gentiles by the 12 apostles. So we call it the Didache and it's D-I-D-A-C-H-E. So it's, it looks like Didache, but it's Didache. So I encourage you to get that. So it's one of the oldest and most respected ancient Christian documents that we have. We don't know who the original author was, probably more than one author. Um, we don't know an exact date, um, but we know that it was in its final form by the middle of the second century. So we're talking about it possibly began circulating as early as the latter half of the first century. So this is a document that took a while to write because it's a it's an it's a it's a sort of a, an anthology. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but it's a it's a collection of apostolic teachings that was put together over a number of years, and then it was presented in its final form. Um, probably teachings from different places that was uh, compiled by one or more editors, probably. But we have reason to believe that the Didache began to be circulated in its early form in the 60s, and in its final form by 150-ish or so. So what this means is this means that the Didache is quite possibly the oldest surviving document that we can verify from early Christianity that began to be written potentially before or around the same time, you know, Paul was writing and Peter was writing. and uh, James, I think, wrote James in the 50s, so James would have come first. But, <clears throat> but this document may have been circulating around the same time that Peter and Paul wrote. So it's divided into three sections, and its theme, if there's an overall theme to the book, it's to offer teachings. The, the theme that comes up is the two ways of life and death. That, that's the theme that comes up in the book. So the eschatology in the Didache can be found in three different places. So the first one uh, comes at the end of a teaching on how to conduct the Lord's Supper. And this is what it says. Just as this broken bread was scattered upon the mountains and then was gathered together and became one, so may your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. That is an eschatological statement about the end of time. The second statement is also related to communion. And the author instructs the congregation to offer the following prayer at the end of communion. And from the four winds, Gather the church that has been sanctified into your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. For yours is the power and glory forever. May grace come and may this world pass away. So that first and second statement, no real allusion to any timeline, no real allusion to Jesus' second coming. It's just this general eschatological hope of, of when the church is gathered at the end, right? And the third statement actually comes at the end of a brief apocalyptic section, which includes the following statements. So there's, there's, there's two main statements in this apocalyptic section 
that is relevant for us. So the first one says, be ready for you do not know the hour when our Lord is coming. For all the time you have believed will be of no use to you if you are not found perfect in the last time. For as lawlessness increases, they will hate and persecute and betray one another. And then the deceiver of the world will appear as a son of God and perform signs and wonders, and the earth will be delivered into his hands. Then it goes on to say, and then, so after the persecution, after the lawless one, so we've seen that term before, right, in First Clement. So the lawless one appears to be an early Christian term for the Antichrist. So you have persecution, you have the lawless one coming and reigning and performing signs and wonders, and then there will appear the signs of the truth. First, the sign of an opening in heaven, then the sign of the sound of a trumpet, and third, the resurrection of the dead, but not of all. As it has been said, the Lord will come and all his saints with him. Then the world will see the Lord coming upon the clouds of heaven. So I need you to, I need you to, to get this. So this last section in this apocalyptic section of the Didache is describing the same thing that Paul is describing in the text I read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It is the earliest document that we have that shows how the church interpreted the events that Paul wrote about in 1 Thessalonians 4. And they are in this order. The deceiver or the antichrist, the lawless one, appears on the scene, followed by heaven opening, followed by a trumpet, followed by the resurrection of the dead, and finally the Lord's return. So this sequence of events that we see in the Didache, it reflects how the earliest Christians interpreted 1 Thessalonians. It places the appearance of the antichrist and his reign prior to the Lord's appearance, which means that the early church did not believe that Jesus would return and rapture them out of the world to escape tribulation. Now, we cannot downplay the importance of the Didache, and I'll tell you why. Some early Christians, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Didymus the Blind, revered the Didache as scripture. Early Christians read the Didache as scripture. It is the most compelling early church document we have and was probably circulated at the same time as many of the original New Testament letters written by Paul, written by Peter, certainly the Gospels, maybe the Gospel of John. So <clears throat> that is a, as a, a really compelling case for what the early church believed about the events of the last days. So now let's look at um, Against Heresies by Irenaeus. He was Bishop of Gaul, that's modern-day France. He wrote five books to combat, to combat Gnostic heresies. And if you don't, don't know what Gnosticism is, just Google it. I'm not going to go into it in this lecture. He wrote five books to combat Gnostic heresies, and we refer to those five books just generally as Against Heresies. So in book four, he writes the following. Jesus will come on the clouds bringing on the day which burns as a furnace and smiting the earth with the word of his mouth and slaying the impious with the breath of his lips and having a fan in his hands and cleansing his floor and gathering the wheat indeed into his barn, but burning the chaff with unquenchable fire. <clears throat> so, so this sequence of events reveals that Irenaeus believed that Jesus, Jesus is coming would be a time when the church is gathered and the unrighteous are judged. This is the fourth time that we see judgment associated with Jesus's return, not rapture. He doesn't include any statement that would lead anyone to believe that he thinks that the events are separated by a rapture of the saints. In book five, he writes <clears throat> the following about Jesus's second coming. It behooves the righteous first to receive the promise of the inheritance which God promised to the fathers and to reign in it when they rise again to behold God in this creation which is renovated and that the judgment should take place afterwards. So although in that 
statement, he's speaking in really broad terms. He doesn't mention anything that would make his first, uh, his second century reader think that he was espousing a belief in any way of a secret calling away or snatching away <clears throat> of Christians. And so those are the main four because those were the four in that early period that had the most eschatology. Of those other works that I cited, um, they had limited elements of eschatology, um, but really none included anything similar to Darby's doctrine that I could reasonably compare because I wanted to do a reasonable comparison. It's also important to note, I spent some time at the beginning of this lecture saying, hey, the linchpin in his theology was Revelation 12, 5. And out of the, the dozens of, of early church resources that I combed through, I could not find a single anti-Nicene writer that made any mention of Revelation 12, 5 when discussing Jesus's return. Now, the first full commentary on Revelation doesn't wasn't written until the sixth century. So it's it's difficult to understand why Darby thought this was an apostolic interpretation. So here are the conclusions, and you probably know where I'm going with this. So as we examine <clears throat> anti-Nicene eschatology, what's apparent? Clearly, early, early in the research, it became apparent, but I, you know, kept digging. It's apparent that the doctrine of a secret rapture of the church prior to the Great Tribulation isn't present in early church theology. The closest aspect of rapture theology that you can detect in anti-Nicene, um, in the anti-Nicene period, is this sense of imminence. But it's important to remember, like I said earlier, that they considered life under the thumb of Rome to be adequate conditions uh, for tribulation. So here's here's some of the, the questions that I think are fair to ask. So, so the, the conclusion is rapture theology absent from early church eschatology. So question that you could ask is, does this mean that the early church did not believe in a rapture? Not necessarily, but its absence from anti-Nicene texts supports the conclusion that they did not. If Darby had not proposed a Darby, this is, I mean, this is important for you to note. <clears throat> if John Nelson Darby had not proposed a doctrine of the rapture in the 1800s, we would not be discussing it since nothing similar to that can be found among the early church writers. So what does this mean for proponents of the rapture? If you're watching this, you're like, I believe in the rapture. I believed it my entire life, you know, like me. First, and this is, you know, this is tough, but you have to be more concerned with truth than you are with preserving whatever you believe. So what does it mean if you believe in the rapture? So first, at the very minimum, it means that the foundational proposition of rapture theology, which is that it has apostolic origins, has been disproven. And secondly, since we cannot corroborate Darby's interpretation of Revelation 12.5 with anti-Nicene writers, it means that both his exegetical framework and his interpretations are not aligned with anti-Nicene beliefs. So at the end of this research project, I was really faced <clears throat> with somewhat of a doctrinal issue. The church I attend now, it's not a church of God. It's not a Pentecostal church. It's a, an evangelical church. Um, my pastor does not believe in a rapture. And I have toyed with the idea that the rapture was not a biblical doctrine, certainly not a doctrine supported by early church theology. I've toyed with that idea for a couple of decades, but you know, it really didn't seem to me a fight worth fighting because people that believe it have a, have a lot of hope in it. You know, it's, it's a, it, it gives you a lot of hope that there's going to be an escape for this. And so um, really it's, it's after this research project, I'm, I'm willing to say definitively 
based on research, at least as far as I can tell, that um, rapture theology is not a biblical doctrine. The church believed from, from the time of the apostles until the mid-1800s, the church believed that the church would live through the reign of the Antichrist and the tribulation and Jesus would return at the very end of things to, to judge the nations and bring down a new heaven and a new earth. That's what Christians believed for 1800 years. And then John Nelson Darby issues his theology and a really small segment of Christians, evangelicals and Pentecostals, believed it and ran with it. You don't find the theology in the Eastern church. You don't find it in the Coptic church. You don't find it in the Ethiopian church. And so, <clears throat> so what I'm comfortable saying is that I am aligned with the early church's belief that Christians will be exposed to the Antichrist reign and will go through the Great Tribulation until Jesus returns at the end of all things. And so um, that's where I am. And that's, uh, the, that's where my research uh, took me. And I hope this was something that was interesting to you. I hope you learned something. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again uh, soon for the next lecture.